How much time does our world have? History is littered with man's failed attempts for utopia on Earth. Kingdoms crumble and empires evaporate. What is the destiny of man? How can one find personal peace? Can we know the future? Yes, we can. Throughout the scriptures, God has sent messages of hope to help us recognize our place in time and prepare for the future. Join us now as Amazing Facts presents Millennium of Prophecy with Doug Batchelor. Good morning and welcome to another event here in New York, a very eventful day that is here at Millennium of Prophecy in the wonderful city of New York at the Manhattan Center. And we're so glad that you've chosen to join us today for a very important topic entitled The Millennium. What does the Bible say about the 1,000 year period in scriptures? Stand by with us and we'll make sure that God's word is clear to you. And friends, we're so glad that you've chosen to take the time to invite friends and family members to make this event one that is not only special to us, but also special and lasting for yourself. Let us this morning welcome Pastor Doug Batchelor. Good morning. Happy Sabbath. You know, today, because we're doing a combination of a lesson and our Sabbath worship time, um, you should see what's going on behind the scenes right now in our trying to merge what we've been doing for the last two weeks in a lesson presentation and say, wait, this is a Sabbath service, and uh, we're sort of scrambling back there. But it's pretty exciting, let me promise you. We'd like to extend a special greeting to you, a special Sabbath welcome. We want to welcome those who are participating with us. Some are keeping their first Sabbath day today. Can you say amen? amen. Around the world, we'd like to wish you a Dobre Subota, Feliz Sabado, a Sabata Fia Fia in Samoa. I've learned how to say Happy Sabbath in about six languages. Need to use it whenever I can. I'd like to invite Mrs. Bachelor to come out. Now, we do not have our regular Bible question time at this point. You know, we would like to take this time right now to pray with our groups that are meeting with us around the country, with our groups that are meeting right here. And if it's possible, you know, our chairs are strapped together in our Manhattan audience and it may not be easy for you, but uh, Karen and I would like to kneel. We invite you to kneel. We would like to pray as we enter into our study time and our worship today. Our loving Father in heaven, Lord, to begin with, we want to thank and praise you for the miracles that we are witnessing both here in New York City and around the world. We give you the glory. Thank you, Lord, for the blessings that we've seen. And we know there are so many we know nothing of that are recorded in heaven. We pray that you will continue to infiltrate the hearts and minds of people with your love and your spirit. Lord, we know that Jesus is coming soon, that we are entering the millennium where prophecy will all meet its fulfillment. And I'm praying that the importance of these messages, that the prominence it deserves in the hearts and lives of people will be clearly seen. Lord, I pray that you will confound the devil and all of his plans to distract people and that Christ might be lifted up and people will be drawn to the cross. We thank you for this sacred Sabbath day and I pray that each person who might be keeping it for the first time will realize the blessing that you've poured into this dimension of time. Please be with us here in Manhattan. I pray that you'll bless our study today and help us to know that we've been in your presence. Expand your kingdom. In Christ's name we ask. Amen. Amen. Our study today is dealing with the subject of the thousand years that you find in Revelation chapter 20. And we also at Amazing Facts have a study guide that goes along with this. It's called Coming World Blackout. That's probably a good place for me to lead into our amazing facts for this morning's study. So if I could direct your attention to our lesson. The lesson is Arresting the Land. New York City blackout, 1965. Millions of people 
were suddenly plunged all the way from New York City to Canada into abject darkness. It was historically uh, probably one of the most severe power failures in history. The most densely populated area in the world is New York City. There's about 28,000 people per square mile. You know where the most sparsely populated spot is? Alaska, about one person per square mile. New York City, Manhattan, all the way up to Canada, plunged into darkness. I was here then. How many of you were here in New York City when that happened that remember that? I remember my mom was gone. My brother and I were home alone, and the lights went out. And so we went digging around in the dark and found some candles, and, and uh, it's a wonder we didn't burn our apartment down. And then we went upstairs to visit some of our neighbors, and their mother was gone. And so we had a real party that day. <laughs> But uh, I remember vividly all the different stories about people trapped in elevators. There, there was gridlock on the streets. Folks kept their engines running all night long to try and keep the headlights on so some people could function in the streets. And people pulled together during times like that. There was a lot of heartwarming stories. And uh, some babies were born in elevators and interesting things like that. But uh, a little girl was born in an elevator called her Ellie. Ellie. I made that up. I don't know that for sure. <laughs> I'm sorry. You know, some people are concerned as we approach the year 2000 with this Y2K glitch that there's going to be massive power failures, and they're very frantic about that, and they're stockpiling garbanzo beans and things like that. I'm not worried about that. I do think there are some things on the horizon that should cause us concern. Not having electricity is not one of them. I believe that people can be resourceful and those problems will be overcome. What, I concern, what I'm concerned about is panic. I don't trust human nature. And when people anticipate that there's going to be a shortage of something, they run on the banks and they run on the markets and they buy up the generators. And uh, I'm worried about this turn of the century and the, the hype and the hysteria connecting with it being a catalyst for the devil capitalizing on uh, bringing in some more control because you know the Bible tells us in Revelation before the final events there will ultimately be one world religion. People are driven to God by love and fear. And what is about to happen, I see a lot of people turning to God out of fear. You know the Bible does tell us there is going to be a major blackout in the world, but it's going to be a thousand year blackout. And that's the subject of our study. Let's go to our historical that's in our lesson, our lesson dealing with resting the land. You know, back when God first made the world, everything was perfect in its beauty, in its glory. There was great vitality and vigor in all the creatures and in the very soil. But with the entrance of sin, even the ground itself was cursed. God said, cursed is the ground for your sake. And he further explained that because of this curse, in the sweat of your face you shall eat your bread. Up to that point, in the Garden of Eden, man's work was a very a pleasant work, training the vines and doing creative things with what God had made. But it became a, a more arduous, toiling sort of work. The ground brought forth amalgamated plants with thistles and thorns, and the whole creation became perverted and corrupted because of sin, including that the vitality of the soil was depleted. The Bible tells us that part of the curse that God rehearsed to Cain, when you till the ground, it shall not henceforth yield thee her strength. The vitality of the ground was influenced. Because of this, God implemented a law that he gave to his people where they were to give the land a year off. The land was to enjoy a Sabbath for a couple of reasons. You can read about this in Exodus chapter 23, verse 10 and 11. Six years you shall sow your land and gather its produce. But the seventh year you shall let it rest, let it Sabbath, and lie fallow, that the poor of your people might eat. They could glean the volunteer crops that would come up. You remember the story of Ruth, where she, a poor person, was going behind the reapers and gleaning. Well, during the volunteer year, or the Sabbath year, 
God intended that the poor could eat those crops, that they had put up enough provisions. He was going to bless their increase, extra blessing if they let the land rest. You know, God has a way of making nine-tenths go farther than ten-tenths. And if they had let the Sabbath of the land remain intact, he promised to give them an, an abundance during the six years of farming, just like he did during the famine in the days of Joseph. During the years of plenty, they had extra food. But the people didn't trust God. And you can read in the Bible, there's actually no record of them ever allowing the land to keep a Sabbath. They evidently kept on farming, kept on harvesting, kept on sowing year after year. And finally, after years of rebellion and turning away from God, judgment came. The Bible tells us that the king of Babylon, Nebuchadnezzar, he came and he burnt the house of God and he broke down the wall of Jerusalem and he burnt the palaces thereof with fire. Notice this in 2 Chronicles 36. It tells this whole passage here. And them that had escaped from the sword carried away, carried he away to Babylon, the golden uh, city of Babylon. Notice what else it tells us in this passage about what happened. Until the land had enjoyed her Sabbaths, for as long as she lay desolate, she kept Sabbath to fulfill 70 years, three score and 10 years. In other words, God was saying, this king came who brought judgment. He burnt Jerusalem in the promised land. Some were slain, some were spared. The ones who were spared were taken back with the king to the golden empire. After the land kept its Sabbath, then during the time when uh, they were in Babylon, what was the condition of the land of Israel? The Bible tells us that the walls of Jerusalem are broken down. The gates thereof are burned with fire. The land was desolate. It was empty. It was vacated. Then after their 70 years, when the land was done keeping Sabbath, the people returned and began to rebuild Jerusalem and rebuild the temple. They made a new Jerusalem. And there was great rejoicing and a great solidarity among the people. It says, so we built the wall, for the people had a mind to work. Now let me draw the parallel for you in this historical. We're talking about the thousand years of revelation that you find in, in chapter 20, sometimes called the millennium. There are two principal views on this subject. All Christians who believe in prophecy believe in the millennium. There are even people in the secular world that talk about the thousand years of peace. Some believe the millennium is kept here on earth with the righteous reigning over the wicked. I respectfully disagree. There are many other Christians who believe that when the Lord catches away the saints, we go to where he's prepared a place and we live and reign with him in glory for a thousand years. That's what I believe the Bible teaches and I will seek to prove that. In our historical, that's what happens. For 1,000 years, our world is going to keep Sabbath. The land is going to be fallow. It's going to be desolate. Those who are not destroyed by the brightness of King Jesus coming go back to the golden empire, right? At the end of that thousand year Sabbath, we come and there is a new Jerusalem and he creates a new heaven and a new earth and there's rejoicing among the people. It's a perfect parallel, a little microcosm in that story to help us understand what is about to happen. Now from about 4004 BC, the approximate date for creation, for 6,000 years now, Christ has been sowing the seed of the gospel. Revelation says he's coming soon to harvest the ripe grain in the tares and the chaff will be burned. All these stories in the Bible are there to help us understand what is about to happen. Then we will spend a thousand years Sabbath with the Lord, amen, in the kingdom, resting with him. And what will the condition of the world be during that time? We're going to study this now in more detail in our lesson. Let's go to question number one. What events, incidentally, most of the information on this subject is found in Revelation chapter 20. You can find a little bit in Ezekiel 38 and we'll uh, pop around a couple of times and give you some more of the information. Question number one, what events mark the beginning of the 1,000 years found in Revelation chapter 20? Say the answers with me. For the Lord himself shall descend from heaven with a shout. And the Bible tells us, and the dead in Christ shall rise first. So there's a resurrection and the second coming. And then what happens after that? It says, they lived and they reigned with Christ for a thousand years. Now some people have wondered, Doug, 
If a day equals a year in prophecy, then how do we know the thousand years is a literal number? Have you ever heard that question before? Well, if it's not, I don't mind. If a day equals a year, that would be 360,000 years. That'll be okay with me. But I do think it's literal. Why? A day equals a year in prophecy in this life. Once we enter eternity, God is not using those symbols anymore. Okay? It means just what it says. So I do believe it's a literal thousand years, just as there have been a literal 6,000 years preceding it, there will be a literal thousand year Sabbath. And friends, it's almost sunset. We're almost there now. We are living in the twilight hours of the world's history. The rest of the answer tells us, speaking of the, uh, uh, marking the beginning of the millennium, the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years were finished. This is the first resurrection. Now, this is often commonly called the millennium. The word millennium is not in the Bible. You don't find the word trinity in the Bible, but there are certain teachings that are in the Bible. The word millennium is a composite of two Latin words, milli and annum, and it just means thousand years. Revelation refers to it as the thousand years. It begins with the first resurrection and the second coming of Jesus. It ends with the second resurrection of the wicked. There's a thousand year span between the two. Question number two. What else will happen at the time of the first resurrection? What happens then? Answer, it says, we will not all sleep, but we shall be changed in a moment in the twinkling of an eye for at the last trumpet, for the trumpet will sound and the dead shall be raised incorruptible. Philippians chapter 3, verse 21. It says, who will change our vile body that it might be fashioned like unto his glorious body. Will we have real bodies when that time comes? Did Jesus have a real body? When he rose, it says, we will get bodies like his glorious body. We will live in all four dimensions during that time. 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 8. Then shall that wicked be revealed, whom the Lord shall consume with the brightness of his coming. And then Revelation 16, 18, 20, and 21, it tells us that the beginning of the millennium is marked with a great earthquake, such as was not since men were upon the earth. So mighty an earthquake and so great. And every island fled away, and the mountains were not found. And there fell upon men a great hail, hail out of heaven, every stone about the weight of a talent. It's about 56 to 75 pounds. They're not sure. I used to live in Texas. Woke up, you know, they say everything's bigger in Texas. Woke up one morning, we had hailstones that were like somewhere between peanut and walnut size. And actually dented. Every car that was not parked was damaged. The body shops were completely overloaded with hail-damaged cars for months after that. And uh, you heard me give you an amazing fact about the biggest hail on record was softball-sized hail in Bangladesh that killed several people. Can you imagine what the results would be of hailstones where there's 70 pounds, 75 pounds apiece, and a great earthquake? Now, does it sound like it's life as usual after the millennium begins here on the planet? It's telling you the wicked are destroyed with the brightness of his coming. And this is earthquake that measures 15 on the Richter scale. Islands are swallowed up. Mountains are moved out of their places and flattened out. And it's not going to be life as normal. The wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. Revelation 20, verse 1 and 2. Then it tells us, an angel laid hold on that dragon, that old serpent, who is the devil and Satan, and bound him a thousand years. Now, this is a part of the story that some people struggle with. It talks about the devil being bound in what? What's he bound in? What do they call it in, in uh, King James Version? The bottomless pit. I remember when I went to Carl's Bad Caverns in New Mexico that uh, for years, right after they first discovered Carl's Bad Caverns, they had this one area where there was this great big gaping chasm and they shined their lights down. They couldn't see the bottom. And the first few tourists they took through there, they called it the bottomless pit. And the tour guide would take a stone and he'd throw the stone off and the stone would go. <whistles> guide would say, bottomless pit. Probably just came out of China somewhere. <laughs> and you know, that was real tourist attraction. Finally, they got an exploring group together and they put on their, 
their uh, gear and their ropes and they began going down. They only went down about 300 yards. They found the bottom. The bottom was full of this very fine, silty lime sand and hundreds of little stones. What was happening is the stones were going down going, Poof, they didn't hear that. It wasn't a bottomless pit. And when the Bible tells us the devil is bound in a bottomless pit, friends, to be honest with you, I don't know why the King James translators that were doing Revelation, you realize different translators focused on different parts of the book, took that word that was translated other ways in other parts of the Bible and became eloquent and said, bottomless pit. There's no other else where they translate the word abusos that way, and that's what the word means. If you look at the Greek New Testament, the Septuagint, it's called the Septuagint because it was translated by 70 scholars, where it talks about the earth in its chaotic void condition. It's described as the abusos, the abyss. How many of you remember that story that's found in Luke chapter 8, verse 31, where Jesus is getting ready to cast the demons out of this demoniac, a legion of demons? And they pled, these demons are pleading with Jesus, do not cast us into the abusos. The very same word you find in Revelation chapter 20. What it means there is don't cast us into the nothingness. See, the abyss for the devil represents the world. They're captive in, they're chained in this world, the Bible tells us, with nobody to possess. I don't believe the devil is interested in haunting houses. We know the devil takes possession of serpents. And those demons filled pigs. We already know what he does with people. The devil wants to manipulate living creatures, not two by fours and plaster and masonry. And so when devils have nobody or no living thing to manipulate or to tempt, they go stir crazy. They're in chains of darkness, the Bible tells us. The abyss during the thousand years where the devil is bound is not a big black hole somewhere in the universe. He is bound on this decimated, depleted planet with no people alive to tempt or manipulate. The devil's a workaholic. That to him is the highest form of torture. That's why the demon said, please don't send us into nothingness. Let us at least possess the pigs. And that's what you find there in Luke chapter 8. Okay, back to our lesson. Question number three. Who will be raised in the second resurrection and when does this take place? Say the answers with me. John 5, 28. All that are in the graves will hear his voice and shall come forth. They that have done good unto the resurrection of life, and they that have done evil unto the resurrection of damnation. So who is it that comes forth at the end of the 1,000 years? The wicked. It says in Revelation 25, the rest of the dead, obviously if the righteous are in the first resurrection, who are the rest of the dead, I want to ask? The unrighteous, the wicked. The rest of the dead do not live again until the thousand years are finished. That means they do live at the end of the thousand years. Okay? And that's the answer, second part of number three. Now, there are four kinds of people right now. Jesus said there are two roads, two masters. But there's four kinds of people. You've got the good and the bad, the righteous and the wicked, those that have trusted and followed the Lord, and those that have gone their own way. You've got the righteous living and the righteous dead. You've got the wicked living and the wicked dead. So you've got those four categories. They are all addressed in this lesson. Right now in the world today, you've got the righteous and the wicked alive. When the Lord comes, he's going to make a distinction between the two. Right now, there's two kinds of people asleep. You remember when Jesus, speaking of the second coming, he said two men will be sleeping in a bed. One is taken, one is left. Two kinds of dead people. The dead in Christ rise first. Question number four. What is the condition of the earth during the millennium? And this is what shocks a lot of people. Isaiah chapter 24, verse 1. Behold, the Lord makes the earth empty. He makes it waste. He turns it upside down. Jeremiah 4, verse 23. I beheld the earth, and lo, it was without form and void. Now, some people say, what does that sound like to you? What part of the Bible? Sounds like Genesis, but keep reading. And you find out, is he looking back or is he looking forward? In the heavens, and they had no light. I beheld the mountains, and lo, they trembled. And there was no man. And all the birds of heaven were fled. And that means they were there, but now they're gone. They're done with the feast. And the fruitful place is a wilderness. And all the cities thereof are broken down at the presence of the Lord and by his fierce anger. That's not back in Genesis, is it? This void world that is utterly empty 
is rendered that way by the coming of the Lord. Now, you know why this is important to understand? A lot of dear Christians believe that when the Lord comes and raptures his saints, they only spend seven years with him. The righteous, or rather, the, the wicked are still alive here on earth and they're being converted by 144,000 literal Jews that are preaching and people who were not ready for the first rapture get a second chance. Have you heard this before? I respectfully disagree, friends, because it leaves people with the idea they, if they don't make the secret rapture, they've got seven more years, they're going to have a rough time, but at least they've got another chance to repent. The devil loves that teaching. When the Lord comes, ready or not, that's it, friends. That's why we need to be ready now. You don't know how many people are being taught this, and I know men. Their wives are charismatic uh, members of church, and, and the husband say, yeah, my wife tells me uh, one day I'll be driving the car and she's going to disappear, and I don't know. But if it's true and if she disappears, then I'm going to get my act together, so I'm just waiting. Yeah, a lot of people are waiting. Today, if you hear his voice, do not harden your heart. Today is the appointed time. The best time to do God's will is when you know God's will. Amen? Amen. The best time to listen to his voice is when you're hearing it. You're hearing it now from his word. And so these people who are putting it off, thinking they can wait until after this secret rapture and then get their act together, they are going to be terribly disappointed because they are not going to have that benefit of a warning. Jesus said it's going to come to the world as an overwhelming surprise. Something else that's wrong with that teaching, show me in that teaching. Let me tell you what I don't believe. This is the false teaching. Secret rapture, life goes on here on earth. People, there's a tribulation. Antichrist rebuilds the temple, sits in the literal temple. 144,000 Jews are preaching. At the end of that seven years, then Jesus comes, and the righteous reign over the wicked during the millennium. First of all, that would not be heaven for me. Secondly, when in that scenario is the earth decimated and vacated? When does the earth keep a Sabbath? It, the earth is always busy. There's always people alive in that scenario. These scriptures that talk about the earth being empty, they don't fit anywhere. And you show these scriptures to people who believe that scenario and they go, I don't know, leave me alone. They have no answer for it. The Bible is clear that this world is going to be vacated just as surely as Jerusalem was when Nebuchadnezzar left. So Satan is bound on the earth during that period of time. Did I read Jeremiah 25, 33? And the slain of the Lord shall be at that day from one end of the earth even to the other end of the earth. They shall not be lamented, neither gathered, nor buried. Why aren't they being mourned? Why aren't they being buried? There's none left alive to mourn or conduct funerals, right? Satan is bound for 1,000 years to consider the results of his rebellion. You see, he said, if I was in charge, I could do a better job than God. He's claimed this as his territory. He's called himself the ruler of this world. Even Jesus said the prince of this earth is coming. Well, now he has a thousand years to consider the fruit of his government, the fruit of his philosophy, the principles that he operates by. He will be held bound in darkness for a thousand years on this planet to behold the broken cities and the dead bodies of those who trusted him. And you know it's really going to be creepy. He's not the only one here. He convinced one-third of the angels to trust him. He said, I've got a better idea. Don't follow God, follow me. And he's going to be running from them. They said, we trusted you, now look. And oh, that's going to, I tell you, it's going, to be, uh, it's going to be a living hell, pardon the pun, to be down here on earth with the devil during that 1,000 years, all blaming each other for their disaster. But it doesn't stay that way. You'll see why God allows that. All right, question number five. Where will the saints be during the 1,000 years? And what will they be doing? John 14, 3. Jesus said, I will come again. I believe the Lord, don't you? And receive you unto myself that where I am, there you might be also. Revelation 22, verse 4. And I saw thrones and them that sat upon them, and judgment was given unto them. And they lived and reigned with Christ a thousand years. You can also read in 1 Corinthians chapter 6, it says, Do you not know that the saints shall judge the world? Know ye not that we shall judge angels? Now, let's talk about this for a minute. When the Lord comes, the dead in Christ rise. What direction do we go when Jesus comes? 
He says, I go to prepare a place for you, and if I come again, I'll receive you unto myself, that where I am, in my Father's house, you may be. There's no question. We're going up when Jesus comes, okay? The dead in Christ are risen. Those who are, remain and are alive are transformed. We're given glorified bodies. We all go up. We leave the planet. The wicked are destroyed by the brightness of his coming. There's a terrible earthquake. There's a hail. They don't survive that. Satan is bound for a thousand years on this planet that is a void, obscure, chaotic, crumbling, ugly mess. The Bible describes it as the abyss. It's the darkness. During the 1,000 years when we live and reign with Christ, we are sharing his, his palace. That's the sense that we reign. Some people say, well, if we're not reigning over the wicked, then who are we reigning over? I don't ever want to reign over the wicked. Do you? No, it's talking about reigning with Christ. We're going to live and reign. There's unfallen worlds. God is going to move the capital of the universe to live with humanity. In that sense, we reign with him. And what a privilege when you think about it. We're going to live in the capital of the infinite cosmos. But when we first get to the kingdom, we're going to have a lot of questions. How about you? Amen. A lot of questions. There's going to be some surprises. There's going to be three surprises I heard a preacher say once. The first surprise is that we're there. The second surprise is going to be there are some people there we never expected to see. Third surprise is there's going to be some people missing who we thought would be leading the parade. And we're going to ask our angels, where's so-and-so? And they're going to say, not here. And we're going to want to know why. See, the Lord wants us to enter eternity trusting him. The whole reason that this terrible experiment with sin was sold on the world is because the devil was able to get Eve to doubt God. The Lord wants to settle all our doubts. He wants us to have faith. And so we'll say, but why isn't deacon so-and-so here? And the angels will say, come with me. They'll take us to the heavenly libraries. Now, the Bible says God has books. God uses that word so we can relate. I don't think the Lord has books that are made out of paper, pulp from trees that are cut down. When the prophets revealed things to, or when the angels revealed things to the prophets, they were given three-dimensional video, hologram, multi-technicolor. Uh, and I think the Lord's got these shelves or records somehow. We don't know how the angels are going to push the button. But they'll take us to the record of, of Deacon Jones or whoever it is. We say, I thought he'd be here. He seemed like such a good man. And he says, well, there's something you need to know. You can look at the records. Now, the sins of the righteous are under the blood of the Lamb. You promise that. They are erased out of that book of records. We are forgiven for Christ's sake, but not the sins of those who are lost. Jesus said those things done in secret will be shouted from the housetop. That's one very powerful motive for me to serve Jesus is I don't want you all to look at my book. <laughs> I don't want you to know what I've done. And you probably don't want me looking at your book, do you? <laughs> so the angel will take him and show them the record book and he'll see where the Lord did everything he could do in Deacon Jones' life to save that individual. But there was a hidden sin that he hid from the church and he hid from the people that he couldn't hide from God. Amen. And then we're going to have some other surprises. People are there and we thought, what are they doing here? You've made a mistake. You had a bug in your computer or something like that. How could this happen? For instance, can you imagine the look on Stephen's face when he sees Paul being a, given a position of glory in the kingdom? Stephen's going to go over to his angel. He said, you guys typically do really good work, but you know, I don't know how to tell you this, you've made a mistake. Last time I saw him, he was executing Christians, and now he's being carried on the shoulders of angels. What's that all about? And the angel says, come here, we'll show you the books. After he stoned you, the Lord got his attention on the road to Damascus, and he was changed, and he became one of the greatest apostles. And Stephen's going to go, wow, I guess we'll let him stay. <laughs> See? And so God wants everyone to trust him. And you will look at the books and you will see that God did everything he could do within the realms of justice and mercy to save as many as he can because God is not willing that any should perish. So during this thousand years, we're going to have a lot of questions. I'm going to need to talk to some of the Bible characters and ask them some questions. I've got lots of questions. I read these stories. I need to ask Jacob, how is it that he didn't know that Leah was Leah until the morning. 
Pardon me, but that just really is hard for me to comprehend. But they will all have questions, right? And so that's during the 1,000 years. It's a time of our judging. Now, when it says we judge the angels, are we deciding who's saved and who's lost? No, of course not. God determines that. Keep in mind the word judgment biblically, you know, we picture these people sitting at a bench with a gavel and a black cape and they're going, innocent, guilty, next case. That's not how God is referring to the judgment during the 1,000 years. Have you, you ever used the expression that that person has good judgment? That doesn't mean all day long they're going, guilty, innocent, guilty, innocent. That means that they are discerning, evaluating. We will be investigating God's judgment. See, you and I are not determining who's saved and lost. We're not deciding whether Satan's angels will be forgiven. But we are confirming and endorsing and having faith in God's justice because he wants us to enter eternity trusting him. No more doubts, so sin will never rise up again. Amen. You understand? All these things will be settled during the 1,000 years, and not to mention... It's a thousand year Sabbath. You'll get to enjoy the bliss of paradise in the city of God and the presence of God for a thousand years to rest. Don't have to study war no more. All right, back to our lesson. Question number six What will happen at the close of the 1,000 years? Zechariah 14. It says, Behold, in that day the Lord comes, and his feet shall stand in that day upon the Mount of Olives, which is before Jerusalem on the east. And the Mount of Olives shall cleave in the midst thereof. And the Lord my God shall come and all the saints with thee, and the Lord shall be king over all the earth. Revelation 21, verse 2. And I, John, saw... You know how John says that? In Gospel of John, he never even mentions his name. He was so humble. But he is so overwhelmed, he's saying... I, John, saw the new Jerusalem. Can you imagine how he must have trembled when he penned those words? I've seen it. It's real. I got it straight from the Lord. Trust me. Oh, friends, I wish that we could sometimes get a glimpse of what God has prepared for the redeemed. You would become highly motivated to do God's will. I think sometimes we don't really believe. And if we really believe what God has prepared, we'd love him more and we trust him more. I saw the new Jerusalem coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. Why do Jesus' feet touch the Mount of Olives? You remember when the Lord ascended? He ascended from the Mount of Olives. It says he went over towards Bethany, away from Jerusalem on a mountain. That was the Mount of Olives. The angel said he's coming back the same way he left. He's coming with his angels. He left with his angels. The next time his feet touched the planet... It's the same place they last touched the planet. The Mount of Olives is where he wept in the Garden of Gethsemane and perspired blood. And he said, not my will, thy will be done. It's where he covenanted with his own blood to take our place with the Father. It was on the Mount of Olives that he wept over Jerusalem. And now the new Jerusalem comes down because the old Jerusalem rejected him. And he said, your house is left unto you desolate. So there's great significance to that. Not only that, but God had, all through the Old Testament, promised to give a certain geographic territory to Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and their descendants, and those who are children of Abraham by faith. He kept promising to give them the promised land. But the people of God have constantly fought over that promised land. They've never really enjoyed it. Even Abraham was a pilgrim and a stranger because he was looking for what? A city that had foundations, 12 of them, a matter of fact. So Abraham will ultimately get the promised land in the New Jerusalem because the borders of the city of God, 375 miles on each side, you will easily fit all of what God promised to the children of Israel in those borders. The Mount of Olives in the middle. The city of God in the middle of it will be the Garden of God. We've studied that. And so do you see what God is doing? He's keeping his promise. Within the walls of the New Jerusalem is the promised land that he promised to all of Abraham and his descendants. Then they'll finally enjoy the reward that they had sought for. We don't really get a possession in this life, do we? I hope your treasure's not here. I like that song I used to sing. You know, I used to go to Charismatic Church before I learned some of the things I'm sharing with you. I like a song we used to sing. This world's not my home. I'm just a passing through. We're pilgrims and strangers, right? And so 
Someday we will get the promised land and it will all be within that city. The Mount of Olives is where Jesus will touch down. Number seven. What will happen next to free Satan from his prison? Answer, Revelation 20, verse 5 and verse 7. But the rest of the dead live not again till the thousand years are finished. And when the thousand years are expired, Satan shall be loosed from his prison. Now, why is God loosing Satan? Why doesn't he just deal with Satan at the beginning of the thousand years? Keep in mind, Lucifer was the highest of God's created beings. Not second highest or third, the highest. There was a terrible upset, an attempted coup in heaven. A lot of loyalty was given to Lucifer. We don't know how long he existed before he rebelled. Are you aware of that? He may have existed for millions of years. We don't know. God is going to deal with him in a very deliberate way before God executes judgment on the devil. He must demonstrate not only to those on earth, but to unfallen angels and other creatures that he has no redeemable qualities. I get questions all the time. People feel sorry for the devil. They say, but if he repented, I know he won't, but if he repented, will God forgive him? And, you know, some of us are more compassionate than others, I guess. But God is loosing him to show that the first thing the devil does when he's got an opportunity is he goes out to deceive again. He is chronic. He can't change. Question number eight. What will Satan do when the wicked are raised? Revelation 20, verse 8 and 9. He will go out to deceive the nations which are in the four quarters of the earth, Gog and Magog, to gather them together to, uh, together to the battle, the number of whom is as the sand of the sea. And they went up on the breadth of the earth and they compassed the camp of the saints about the beloved city. It tells about the wicked who number like the sand of the sea. Now, again, I want to see if I can give you a verbal picture of what's going on here. What is it that binds the devil? Nobody to tempt and manipulate. Nobody to possess. Nobody to control. What is it that liberates him briefly? The wicked are resurrected. You know, Jesus, when his feet touch the Mount of Olives, he calls forth the wicked. The devil can't resurrect anybody. He has no power of life. People always ask, well, Doug, we know that the righteous get glorified bodies when they come out of the grave, and we who are alive are transformed. What about the wicked? What kind of bodies do they get? You know, some of them are blown up in wars and different things. I don't know. I just know the Lord's going to put them back together enough so they know what's going on. They're not going to get glorified bodies, but they will be operational. That's all I know, right? God will take care of that. And it says the devil has loosed a little season. People say, how long is this little season when he goes out to gather together Gog and Magog? I'll talk about that in just a moment. Well, we don't know. It could be a few days, weeks, months. could be longer. The Bible says that Moses chose to suffer affliction with the people of God rather than enjoy the pleasures of sin for a season. It's unspecified. We don't know. But it's long enough for him. I frankly think it's going to be longer than you may expect because he is going to then organize this massive people. They cover the earth like the sand of the sea. Incidentally, remember what I said that out of the 404 verses in Revelation, 278 are found other places in the Bible. You read Ezekiel chapter 38, you'll read about Gog and Magog. It tells, incidentally, go back to Genesis, it tells you Gog was a tribe that was against God's people. They fought against God's people. They were adversaries. Magog means from the matrix or out of Gog. It means Babylon and her daughters or Gog and his children. Okay, that's what that means. They represent the enemies of God's people. You've probably heard folks out there say, I thought it represented Russian China. Meshach is Moscow. And uh, have you heard these things before? There's not one shred of biblical evidence for that. That is total wild speculation. If you read your Bible, Gog and Magog represent the enemies of God's people. It's in Ezekiel 38. Even there it says they cover the earth as a cloud. They come against my people. It's an echo of what you find in Revelation. The whole scenario there in Ezekiel chapter 37 and 38. And it says God fights for them. This is what's going to happen when the wicked surround the city of God. Think about that mass of people. All the wicked who've ever lived from Cain to the present being resurrected. 
Can you understand why they cover the earth like a cloud? We've got six billion on the world now. And they all marshal against the city of God. Adolf Hitler's probably going to be there. Napoleon, somebody got on to me one day and they said, Doug, you shouldn't have said that. You shouldn't judge him. You don't know whether or not he's going to make it. I still don't feel too guilty saying that. Adolf Hitler's probably going to be there. Napoleon, Alexander the Great, who drank himself to death. Yeah, I mean, there'll be some great military leaders in that crowd. And they're going to organize to attack the city of God. You'll see why the Lord is allowing this in just a moment. Question number nine. At this crucial moment, what stops everything? What brings it all to a screeching halt? Revelation 20, verse 11 and 12. And I saw a great white throne, and him that sat on it. And the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to their works. Now, I'd like you to look at an illustration painted by a friend of mine, Joe Maniscalco, while I try to give you the big picture once again of what's happening. When the Lord saves people, can the Lord only save one person at a time sequentially, or can the Lord save 3,000 people at Pentecost at one time? Because the Lord is all-knowing. The Lord could be speaking to your heart and giving you 100% attention right now while he's talking to me. And he could be visiting with everyone here. You and I can't comprehend that. I remember for a little while I went to synagogue here in New York City. That was one question I asked the rabbi. How can God hear everybody's prayers all at the same time? Wouldn't that make his head explode? To try and concentrate on what everybody's thinking all at one time. And I remember the rabbi said, I don't know, God can do it. That was his answer. <laughs> Still looks like a good answer to me. He's all-knowing. Well, God can not only save thousands at a time, he judges them that way. You maybe have had this mental picture that in the great judgment day, there's a line that wraps 12 times around the world, and people are waiting for their turn to come before this white throne one at a time. No, 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 that's not how he's doing it. Thank goodness. He is going to judge millions, billions at a time. He will make their lives pass before them. As they get ready to launch this attack against the city of God, Satan says to all the multitudes of the wicked who have ever lived, keep in mind, these people listened to the devil when they were alive. They're still ready to listen to him when they come out of their graves. They have acknowledged him as their master. When they come out of the grave, Satan still retains a great deal of his glorified form. And he's a brilliant angel. And he and his devils, they say, look, this is our last chance. And they organize a kamikaze battle plan. They say, we outnumber the ones in the city. Ten to one. Broad is the way that leads to destruction. Many there be that go in thereat. They're the majority. Is that clear? And here you've got all these great generals. And of course the Christians, they're the peacemakers. And they say, we can take them. And as he prepares to launch this assault on the city of God, you know what stops everything? Suddenly above the city in the presence where everybody could see, all around the city, everybody's gathered. Everybody who's ever lived will be there that day. You've got the righteous and the good angels in the city. You've got the wicked and the bad angels outside the city. They're separated by a wall. You remember the parable in Matthew 25 where Jesus said, the day is coming when I'm going to separate the sheep from the goats. One group will be blessed and one will be cursed. One's going to be with the good angels, one's going to be with the bad angels. That's the day that Christ is talking of. And before the devil launches the attack, he says, it's my city. That man in there, he's an imposter. I am the rightful owner. We can take it. And he's just getting ready. God the Father, Son, and Spirit will elevate above the city where all can see him and they will reveal their glory. And the panorama of the great controversy will be seen in the heavens. Each individual will see in their own heart, in their own life, how God has done everything he could to save them. They'll remember clearly then all the occasions where the Holy Spirit called them and they resisted or even more dangerous, they postponed. They kept putting it off. One of the most deadly words is tomorrow, not now. And they'll see that God bore patiently with them. He pled with them. They'll see how they spurned the invitations of grace. There'll be some other dynamics that take place during that time. You know, people think that once you get to heaven, there's absolutely no sad emotions. The righteous who are on the walls in the New Jerusalem, they may see some who are on the outside. That they may have influenced in a wrong way. They're in the city, God's forgiven them, but we, even the saved, are going to know the results of our lives. We're forgiven by the blood of Christ, but that doesn't mean God brainwashes us where we're just 
you know, we don't know anything anymore. We're just living in ignorant bliss. And there may be some arguments that are going on between the lost. You knew these things. Why didn't you tell me? There are some parents who think, well, like church is good and religion is good. I don't want to be a Christian, but I'm going to send my wife and kids. They're going to do what you do. No man is an island. If you're in the kingdom, you will find in the kingdom people that are there because of your influence. If you're lost, you will have people around you who are there because of your influence. Everybody is going to be influencing somebody else. No man is an island in that day. So there will be a number of dynamics that are playing during this great judgment time. We will see the panorama of the cross. We will see God's love, his power of love. And we'll see the devil inspiring the mob to say, crucify him, crucify him. Everything will be laid bare during that time. And then the whole world will recognize that Christ has been just. You see, this is what the whole judgment's about. God wants us to trust him. It's at that time, then everyone kneels down. I'm getting ahead of myself now. This is coming up in the next question. Number 10, what happens after the wicked are judged? Romans 14, verse 11. As I live, says the Lord, every knee shall bow to me. And how many? Every tongue will confess. Does that include Lucifer? Ultimately, constrained by the, the purity and power of God and his justice, the devil will finally fall down and worship. He'll remember his unfallen state and he will declare, Jesus is Lord. I am not God. He is God. All the lost will declare it. They are not being converted. They're simply acknowledging it. Even as the Pharaoh said to Moses that your God is right. You are just and true. And, you know, but he still didn't change his ways, did he? The Pharaoh repented, but he didn't change his ways. And that's the problem with the devil. He goes on to say, Philippians chapter 2, verse 10 and 11. At that time, the name, at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow of things in heaven and things in the earth and things under the earth, and that every tongue should confess that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. Amen. This will be the day when that happens. Revelation 19, verse 1 and 2, it goes on to say, I heard a great voice of much people in heaven saying, true and righteous are his judgments. Do you see what's happening here? The righteous are declaring that God's judgments are just. You know what's going on during the thousand years, technically? God's judgments are being judged. We are examining why God has done what he's done, the way he's done it, and we're declaring he is true. He is right. True and righteous are thy judgments. He wants us to enter eternity with a complete, total faith that he can be trusted, that everything he did was the best way it could be done. In this life, we have a lot of questions, don't we? We wonder, why did God let this happen? Why, why do sometimes the righteous suffer at the hands of the wicked? Why, why, why? There's so many questions. Even the souls under the altar uh, in symbol are saying, Lord, how long do you, till you avenge our blood? There are a lot of questions that we have. All the questions will be answered at that time. Everybody will realize that God did all things well. He is good, good, very good. Because when we enter eternity, there'll be no doubts then. Now, question number 11. What happens next? Then, as they launch their assault on the city of God, they get off their knees of saying, Jesus Christ is Lord, but they cannot change. They launch this assault on the city of God, and the Bible says, say it with me, fire came down from God out of heaven and burned them forever and ever. Oh, what does it say? It did what? It devours them, and then it goes on to say this is the second death, and death means death. It goes on further to say, Revelation 20, 15, whoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. I pray, friends, that your name is written in the book of life. The Bible says in Daniel chapter 12 that there's a book, and everyone who's found in that book will be in the right resurrection. I hope that your name is in that book and your sins are under the blood of the Lamb. They're erased. So let's review quickly what's happening during the millennium. At the beginning of the 1,000 years, what happens first? Second coming of Jesus and the first resurrection. 
it concludes with the second resurrection of the wicked and the holy city in the new Jerusalem descends. What's going on during the 1,000 years? The righteous are in heaven enjoying a thousand year Sabbath and we're asking questions. We're learning about God just as we do on the Sabbath here. And the earth, what's going on there? Nada. Nothing. It's desolate. Satan and his angels are bound here to behold the results of their rebellion. Then at the end of the 1,000 years, they launch that attack. The attack is squelched. The judgment takes place and God rains fire down out of heaven upon them. Number 12. After the fire goes out, what will God do for his people at that time? The answer is, behold, I create a new heavens and a new earth. And then 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 13. We, according to his promise, look for a new heaven and a new earth wherein dwells righteousness. Friends, the purpose of the plan of salvation is that we might become righteous. God is able to make you righteous. Just as the prodigal son came home, he came to the father just like he was. The father covered him with the best robe. Christ will cover all of your sins with his robe of righteousness. That's justification. Then he will teach you to be a new creature. He will give you power to live a new life and to turn away from your sins. That's sanctification. It's not enough, friends, that we experience justification. We must learn by God's grace to be like Christ. Amen? Amen. We got everybody focusing on the big cover-up, justification, and people don't recognize that he has the power to make us righteous, to give us a new heart and a new motives and a new mind. And the righteous are the ones who will live in that city. We need to learn that gift now. We need to learn to live a new life now and to be holy now because those are the meek that will inherit the earth. Number 13, where will God and the righteous finally live? We're going to float around out in heaven on clouds. What does the Bible say? It says, behold, the tabernacle or the dwelling place of God is with men. He will dwell with them. Furthermore, it says, blessed are the meek, for they will inherit the earth. You know, we do have some times of trouble ahead. The Bible tells us that there's going to be some plagues. There's going to be a great tribulation. There's going to be a storm, Jesus said, that will try the foundation you're building on. I pray, friends, that all of you are building on the rock. You don't need to be afraid of that thousand-year blackout. You could be living in a city of light that Christ has prepared for those that trust him where there is no more pain, suffering, and sorrow. If you want to follow the Lamb, wherever he goes, there then, we must first learn what it means to follow the Lamb here now. Amen. I'd like to invite John to come out and sing for us about that place where we want to go, that hope of a country, a land where there is no more struggle, no more darkness, and no more battles. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. There'll be no dark valleys when Jesus comes. Together he's a loved one's home. To Friends, there's coming a day when we will all meet again. We're all going to gather someday either in the city with the redeemed and the Lord and his angels, or we will be on the outside. Today, God's door of mercy is open. What a tragedy that someone would let this opportunity to pass. You can live in light. You don't need to worry about that eternal darkness that will be the fate of the wicked. I'd like to invite each person to bow their heads right now here in our Manhattan Studio Center. You who are watching in your churches and your gathering sites around the country, please bow your heads. If the Holy Spirit is...
tugged at your soul today and you felt that yearning to be in the city, to be with Jesus, to be forgiven now and to follow him now that you might be with him through eternity, would you lift your hand in his presence and say, Lord, I want to be there. You've got possession of my life. Activate your power in my heart. Save me from my sins. Cover my sins and then teach me to follow you. Is, is that your desire, friends? Father in heaven, it's our prayer that you will release your power in the lives of all these who are responding. Help us experience what it means to have that peace of our sins forgiven and also, Lord, to know that we can be living with you in that city and in the new earth through eternity. We ask in Jesus' name. Amen. John, sing another verse of that song. We're going to join you on the chorus. There'll be no more sorrows when Jesus comes. There'll be songs of a gladness when Jesus comes. Oh, the joy of singing when Jesus comes together. Join with me on Gather. Let's stand together, sing. To gather his loved ones home. To gather his loved ones home. There'll be no more sorrow when Jesus comes. To gather his loved ones home. Friends, we are living right now on the threshold of eternity. You've heard me say it many times. Right now, I'd like to speak in a special sense to those of you who have maybe known the Bible truth for many years. It's easy for us to become callous and indifferent. We think, oh, we've, we've heard these things for years, and um, we develop a spiritual callous on our ear. We don't allow the Lord and His Spirit to penetrate our hearts as He needs to do. I'd like to encourage you during the remaining time of this meeting, please come and participate. It's still not too late to bring your friends. I've seen people come in the last two or three meetings and have their lives revolutionized by the Word of God. Don't underestimate the power of the Word. I pray that each of you will fill in your hearts and your souls a yearning to be ready when Jesus comes because we really are living in the final moments in this great controversy between good and evil. Right now we have opportunities, but the night is coming when no man could work. Let us take advantage of this opportunity. You who are watching overseas and around the world, it's still not too late to bring your friends to hear the truth. Tonight's message, we're going to be revealing the beast of Revelation 13, a very important subject we all need to understand. Let's not be indifferent to these themes of prophecy. The Lord is calling us now. He wants us to mobilize, to get ready, to do His work. We are to be soldiers in the army of Jesus. Amen, friends? And so I'm pleading with you from the bottom of my heart. We have a window of opportunity right now to spread the gospel that many might be harvested into his kingdom. Let's take advantage of that time. Is that your desire, friends? Can you say amen? amen. And you around the world, in other countries, I'm appealing to you, please, Come to the meetings. We want to see God's auditoriums and halls and churches around the country. You who are watching in your homes, call our website and find out how to get the materials. You can study along with us by downloading it and invite your friends into your home to study God's word, word with you because we only have a little time left. We want to be in the city when Jesus comes. Amen? Amen. Father in heaven, we thank you for the sacred Sabbath day. And Lord, as we prepare to continue studying your word, Help us to give, seeking first your kingdom and your righteousness, the priority it deserves. We ask in Christ's name, amen. God bless you, friends. Happy Sabbath. Don't forget our meeting tonight. We're dealing with Revealing the Beast. It's talking about bowing to Babylon. Our meeting tomorrow night is the Mark of the Beast. It's called the Mark of Cain. We encourage for you to tell everybody you can. Invite your friends and strangers you might meet to come into the hall and to hear the Word of God. God bless you. Happy Sabbath. We'll see you tonight.